Good morning. And now again, uh, I will invite uh, to the stage uh, our uh, plenary session um, members, um, Vladimir Mao, Rector of uh, Administrative um, Academy, Ksenia Yudaiva, uh, Office of the President of Russia, uh, Richard Michael Daly, ex-mayor of uh, Chicago, John Hawkins, um, founder of Hawkins and Associates, and Simon Anholt, independent uh, expert, uh, Great Britain. And also the mayor of uh, the city of Moscow, Sergei Sabanian. Is translation okay? Uh, those who listen to simultaneous translation, is everything okay? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Happy to see you again at the Moscow Urban Forum, which has become a good tradition. And unlike uh, last year, this year, we have a great Russian winter uh, and lots of snow. Uh, the central subject is uh, megapolis, uh, human scale. Not a new subject, but extraordinary uh, burning for modern cities, especially so for Moscow, which uh, currently uh, is uh, in uh, profound transformation in the history of uh, global megapolises. The industrial epoch of uh, 30th and 80th of last year was the epoch of uh, um, the no, brisk growth of Moscow. Population grew from uh, two to nine million, five times um, uh, bigger the size. The Moscow industrial epoch is not only industrial production and um, uh, and working uh, quarters. Um, Moscow has inherited industrial housing, industrial and municipal transport, education, culture, traders, um, and uh, public catering, and so on and so forth. Uh, the main trends um, of uh, the market epoch of uh, the recent uh, decades is the creation of uh, market infrastructure. Um, we have opened up uh, modern office centers, uh, shops, uh, stores, uh, and houses uh, were created, and um, Moscovites um, uh, uh, now using their cars uh, and not municipal transports. Uh, and uh, last year we had about 1 million cars. Uh, this year it's more than 4 million cars um, uh, in the city. Indeed, it's uh, a very Im very important thing because they created um, a better quality of life in Moscow. But never nevertheless, uh, a city is an integral uh, body uh, and mechanism and because um, it's impossible to change something, not changing at the same speed, something uh, else, um, because otherwise uh, the uh, rapid uh, growth of uh, public space um, led to the change of uh, public infrastructure, and this is exactly what we're uh, witnessing with you. should say that uh, the scale of the problems and uh, the, and we, uh, the Moscovites, were the first to feel it. And uh, the city and the urban community uh, uh, declared that the ideology of uh, development of megapolis of Moscow should change. Instead of creating uh, certain hotbeds of um, private uh, well-being, we should uh, be dealing with um, uh, well-being of the city in general, and the government of Moscow is uh, um, to deal with it. Two years ago, uh, the mayor's office was criticized for doing nothing. Today, we are mostly criticized uh, because uh, we are doing not exactly enough or uh, vice versa, too much, uh, people think. And there are people who even think that we are doing everything wrong, and this is also a good thing. 
but uh, uh, for being passive and uh, uh, reluctance of uh, dealing and solving, we are being criticized. To implement a new ideology of development, uh, we will need new principles of um, uh, city management. We uh, need uh, the modern level of management, uh, a new staff. Um, ready to reject uh, usual routines and stereotypes uh, to start solving new things. And in the recent couple of years, the mayor's office um, um, has uh, been reduced by one uh, third, and the government was almost uh, all replaced by new, with new staff. And we adopted uh, the law um, uh, to elect um, the mayor direct, uh, directly and also the local municipalities, new people with fresh outlooks, uh, have joined uh, the government and um, uh, new um, uh, competences and financial resources were added to solve uh, the local um, uh, problems. Uh, the city leadership is more open now. And we have opened up um, information about the city finances. Uh, the budget um, uh, is um, implementing midterm programs in a year and five years term. Everyone can uh, compare and benchmark uh, the results and goals set and deliverables um, um, to judge on the efficiency of the government's operations. Uh, step by s step, we are uh, getting the feedback uh, with the Muscovites. We uh, set up a special portals um, where everyone can put their feedback and uh, comments. Uh, the list of um, issues uh, we receive complaints on is being expanded. Uh, refurbishment uh, and of roads and houses, the quality of um, operations uh, in polyclinics and uh, different other things. So it's the system of feedback allows us to solve one of the main problems of any major megapolis um, to overcome alienation between uh, the uh, power, the authorities, and the population. People can see that their problems are being solved and they are more um, willing to participate and be involved. Uh, there are different estimates um, uh, of experts. Uh, they say that it's about 40 to 60 percent of um, uh, active um, grown-up population of megapolis are very much interested in being involved in um, different projects and are ready to provide their ideas and act uh, and uh, act as uh, controllers. For Moscow, it means that um, the authority can be uh, based and rely on um, two to three million of well-educated, constructive um, citizens. Citizens. And that's um, very good because it improves our opportunities for our creative work. Thus, we will get a different quality uh, level, uh, attractive, uh, comfortable. Uh, based on uh, our citizens' uh, proposals, we started uh, recovering uh, the uh, space, urban space. In a couple of years, we have reconstructed and erected 50 uh, city parks um, and thousands of Moscow yards uh, have been improved and refurbished. We are doing all those work uh, at a, a new quality of work. Uh, we are um, placing um, different um, uh, thanks. Uh, we are uh, putting uh, ski uh, lines and uh, skating rings. Um, we're improving uh, projects to create some um, uh, pedestrian um, uh, streets and also parking lots. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, planted more than 200,000 new plants and bushes in Moscow, which creates a, a new atmosphere in the city. Moscow is the city with positive demographics. We are expecting more than 125,000 uh, um, Moscovites, young Moscovites, which then will um, and uh, the life expectancy will exceed 75 years. So those are the main uh, uh, major priorities of Moscow. In the recent couple of years, um, every school was joined, um, um, was um, uh, uh, received uh, new computer classes, uh, electronic um, uh, diary books, and a uh, new uh, payment system was introduced which uh, motivate um, teachers uh, to upgrade the quality of education and uh, working with every individual pupil. The schools councils uh, with representatives of the administration and uh, school children and parents now obtain the new opportunity to manage their schools. They approve the budget of their schools and distribute um, the bonuses uh, for teachers. Essentially, a new system of uh, self-management of schools is being introduced. In healthcare, 
Uh, there's a dramatic um, renovation of the material base. The obsolete technology and equipment is replaced with new uh, modern me uh, medical equipment. In 2013, the city hospitals and polyclinics um, will get over to the insurance um, uh, medicine, which will motivate them strongly for a better quality uh, treatment of their patients. And I would like to specially underline that the specifics on transformation of uh, healthcare and other sectors of of um, urban uh, uh, house, housing, because uh, it means that uh, um, we uh, will not lose uh, them uh, all, uh, altogether access, and we will keep all those um, peculiarities and characteristics. But those sectors will have to learn to create new quality of life and uh, uh, acquire the new quality of democracy and be uh, aimed at. Um, and oriented at an individual and not in an abstract uh, something. Dear colleagues, uh, uh, the most complex um, objective for Moscow is uh, to overcome the transport collapse. Uh, we all witness, and to solve it, uh, we had to introduce very uh, tough measures in the government of Moscow. Uh, has uh, revised uh, our relationship with investors, uh, and we terminated hundreds of uh, contracts to uh, build, um, um, uh, construct build buildings that would aggravate the situation in the roads uh, uh, with up to 9 million um, square meters. Well, uh, whether it's big or uh, small, it's more than 30 buildings uh, um, uh, with, uh, at the size of Empire State Building in New York. Of course, all the contracts were terminated in a civilized way with all the reimbursements to the investors and many of them uh, have uh, acquired an alternative uh, proposal from the city to construct it where it is more reasonable and the volume of investments in the recent years has not um, diminished but even increased this year the surplus of investment uh, has uh, uh, reached 23 uh, percent well, the investments of the city were focused mostly on the implementation of programs of development of public uh, municipal transport, uh, subway, and uh, road infrastructure. Uh, currently, we are constructing uh, tens of uh, thousands of kilometers of um, uh, new subway, and we are reconstructing uh, major uh, avenues, uh, tunnels, uh, pedestrian um, uh, passageways, and we are allocating special lines for trolley buses and buses. In a year's time, in Moscow, we will see a new tram. And we have taken measures to recover the accessible uh, city taxi. And just for this year, the number of taxi cars has been increased uh, two, uh, by 2.5 times. And uh, just uh, uh, shortly, uh, the measures have been articulated to restrict uh, movement of uh, cargo transports and trucks um, uh, along uh, the MCAD, which is uh, Moscow Ring Road. And this year, a historical event has occurred. The city has acquired the new territories that uh, has increased um, uh, the size by 2.5 times. Um, uh, those territories uh, are um, called uh, to implement a new industrial policy and polycentric um, city to be created. Um, uh, um, currently, where there's an ex excess of um, uh, employment, um, and labor uh, clusters, so we will have new clusters uh, and the new territories um, uh, will have uh, business, scientific, educational, medical, and sports facilities, as well as recreational centers. Moscow plans to develop uh, uh, subways um, and new territories of the city are all provided on a special exhibition, and I'm sure that you will get acquainted with all of them. Dear colleagues, uh, seemingly, uh, Lech Valencia once compared the transition from social into market economy with um, uh, transformation uh, the fish soup um, uh, pot uh, down to uh, the uh, live uh, fish um, aquarium. But, uh, well, of course, it's a difficult task, but uh, it's doable. And today, uh, there's a live um, a global fast developing megapolis, which is Moscow, which just 20 years ago was uh, a communist um, uh, city of industrial epoch. And I believe that the experience of our transformation deserves attention and might be useful for the modern um, cities. And we, on our part, will be only happy to learn from our colleagues. Um, and that's exactly why we uh, organized this forum and why we invited you. Thank you very much. Wish you success in your work.
Thank you. Thank you, Sergei Simonovich. Well, presently we're opening uh, our two days uh, work, and I would like um, to sort of review the key um, parts, uh, key crossroads uh, we um, our city has uh, in store for it. Uh, and I would like to invite to the stage uh, Vladimir Mao, who is going to speak about the subjects and so-called crossroads uh, in the territories of Moscow that uh, deem important to him. Uh, please show the slides um, to the screen. Good morning, uh, dear colleagues, um, and I would like to start my uh, statement uh, with um, what Sergei Simonovich said at the beginning and at the end. This uh, fish soup pot uh, into a full-fledged um, fish bowl uh, or transforming uh, the city in, into post-industrial city. I think it's a critical thing. It's a key uh, key uh, bullet point and key um, objective. It is focused in one expression. It's indeed transformation of uh, a city of industrial epoch into um, a city with uh, different criteria and different peculiarities of development. The problems of Moscow in this respect um, uh, are both uh, clear and complicated, complicated for implementation, but not exactly unprecedented because the problems of transformation uh, into a um, major post-industrial city uh, were um, and are being uh, solved by uh, major cities. And this slide shows that Moscow uh, is among uh, the major average uh, cities of the world. Let's look uh, further on, uh, say, at uh, this picture here. Uh, we will see that um, Moscow has one very serious fundamental issue, which is uh, uh, that the city conflicting um, um, economic, uh, economic activity. Uh, well, you know, there's a Russian proverb, to work for life or live for work. So Moscow exactly is um, uh, a city where people live to work and not to work to live. And our objective, one of our main objectives uh, that you can see from this slide, is uh, to transform the city into this into a city. Uh, you can uh, uh, live um, high quality and uh, thus even work. Well, it seems to me that, uh, well, there are four uh, provocative bullet points that I put here put them down here, and I think they are uh, outlining the contours of how we can uh, build up this, uh, strategically uh, our Moscow. The first bullet point is what's good for Moscow is good for Russia, which is true, uh, irrespective of how much they contradict and um, juxtapose. Those Moscow to other regions. So there's a big uh, share of active population living in Moscow, which is good, which is not bad. And Moscow is the driver of growth uh, in this respect. And Moscow, in this sense, is whatever facilitates uh, uh, Moscow's growth would um, uh, drag uh, uh, the rest of Russia uh, closer to it. Moscow is very important. The problem of Moscow is, um, I would say, uh, one of them is uh, to uh, retain the creation class in Moscow and Russia. Well, roughly speaking, unfortunately, that's true. Moscow turns out to be a creative firm. Well, uh, rehandling uh, migration point of creative class from Siberia to Paris or London, mostly London to, uh, than Paris. And to retain and keep the creative class, I think, is the most important function of Moscow. The third thing. Uh, the uh, Moscow strategy should have uh, the institutional leadership as the principle, which uh, is uh, not exactly innovations, but the institutions in Moscow should be the best, uh, and I'm going to speak about that later. And the structural transformation, um, uh, Sergei Simonovich uh, um, uh, finished, uh, um, and I will say it's uh, um, keeping, uh, not keeping the traditional uh, industries, but getting over from industries uh, to those uh, that would determine the future of the global economy. Moreover, I would say uh, just um, uh, uh, 
that the structural uh, essence of uh, current global crisis uh, that's uh, um, not matching the recession, which is um, uh, the uh, crisis of uh, global eco economics, e economies, uh, mostly industrial education, healthcare, and the state uh, into the post-industrial pattern where the um, uh, society is more individualistic and um, requires more. That's why. Uh, uh, the countries um, uh, with the uh, most um, developed uh, social industrial states uh, are um, poisoned by the crisis. And I would draw your attention to several systemic problems uh, that um, the answer to which uh, uh, should, of course, be provided. First bullet point is uh, the demographic uh, problem, not purely Moscow. It's the problem of uh, the whole uh, country and all uh, developed countries, despite uh, the um, breakthrough in this situation. We cannot say that uh, Moscow is a, a city with younger population, with a stable or sustainable trend uh, to becoming younger. That's not uh, the case. Uh, moreover, the country and Moscow uh, has uh, stepped uh, into the stage of um, reducing uh, the active population, which is going to be the critical factor of our strategic um, development for the future. So uh, here, uh, I think it's impossible um, uh, to um, uh, keep uh, this problem of migration, but usually it boils down to some negative uh, um, inflow of um, um, unqualified and outflow of qualified staff. Well, getting back uh, to the creative class retaining its uh, creating conditions uh, to uh, make uh, Moscow attractive uh, for um, high quality uh, mi migrants of uh, that uh, creative class that I mentioned, we should not again boil down to external uh, immigration because uh, the modern um, uh, development of space uh, means the concentration uh, of um, people in the, the points of growth. So our answer to the reducing uh, number of population and not only uh, the uh, import of um, uh, labor force, but it's the uh, stimulation of uh, inflow to Moscow from other regions. And I think it's uh, an important thing, whatever people say. That's an important thing for development. Uh, and to be quite candid, I would say that we should motivate the uh, inflow of qualified staff because uh, unqualified will come on their own. In this respect, also, it seems to me um, uh, very important, uh, the tasks. Again, uh, Mr. Sabanin has uh, said about that. Uh, those are the questions of um, uh, the development of education, healthcare, and recreational infrastructure, and uh, the conditions of uh, functioning of our families. Um, first of all, uh, very important here are the education and health care at the very high international level. It's not just the issue of technology, because, you know, for me, criteria of a good university is whether foreign students uh, want to enter, because they have a, a very good choice. The next step is the criteria of a good clinic, whether uh, foreigners uh, go there to be treated, those who are ready to uh, pay for high quality services. I might be reproached in some elite, uh, elitarian uh, approach, but uh, I think that our universities and Moscow clinics should not be at least worse uh, than uh, those uh, globally, because otherwise we will not solve this issue. Because the um, the uh, objective is not just provide a good quality network, but to uh, persuade um, um, uh, people with a good income uh, to uh, be rendered the services here. Because if they uh, get the services here, then uh, the rest of uh, the infrastructure would come up, otherwise they would uh, come down to the demand of some other social groups, and uh, thus um, uh, it is the demand of um, well, which is not going to uh, drag the sectors up. Well, the problem of uh, institutional um, 
priorities because Moscow should become a source, well, uh, to be the space of effective uh, court uh, and the most, uh, the fairest police. Uh, well, of course, it's a federal prerogative, we can say that, but you know what? Uh, I've studied this thing. Uh, why Alexander II managed to solve uh, uh, the court um, uh, reform? Because the Russian Empire court was uh, awful. It was ugly. It was more corrupted than the average um, um, uh, average uh, officials. And uh, we know that uh, they succeeded uh, immensely. No one ever uh, studied the details, but um, they did it. And out only after the Alexander II, they were cascading it down. But in fact, the creation of the best um, judgmental and um, uh, judicial institutions is uh, something very doable, doable um, with a concentration and focus of political will. Again, if I'm, uh, I, I'm I, that, uh, I, that you can say that it's mostly pre federal prerogative, um, but um, we used to have in the Soviet Union additional uh, prerogatives and authorities. Um, uh, against um, uh, other leadership. Well, modernization of economic structure, which is uh, my next slide. And I would like to draw your attention to that. Uh, quite a clear cut slide. We have to provide here uh, the structural shifts uh, to to the creation of sectors uh, of technological services. Formally, we can say that Moscow indeed and Russia in the recent uh, couple of decades um, uh, been shifting um, to industrialization and uh, the share of industry has reduced down to 50 percent and uh, and employment and GDP. But we still realize that um, it is not yet a high uh, tech services. And we do realize, uh, as Marx used to say, uh, uh, well, uh, there's, uh, well, well, all uh, the services, including trades, uh, they, uh, were not so uh, well developed, and of course, the uh, economics uh, reacted to uh, with the growth of just simple services. Uh, this is the way Spain, after Franco, was developing. And if we look at the structural shifts after Franco, it seems it seemed very much. It's not the mobilization of um, the development of services uh, services sectors, but we do realize that in the modern time, it's mostly high tech services that should be provided. And uh, well, here's the structure of Moscow GDP against other global cities. And this is the desirable structure of the Moscow economy, uh, where quite real, realistic, desirable and realistic that um, could have uh, such sectors um, as um, uh, high tech, uh, uh, high value added sectors to dominate. And this uh, is where the reduction of uh, mass production sectors and non servicing sectors would reduce. This is a very important criteria. Mass production, not servicing the requirements or demand of the city, cannot um, uh, be uh, the point of uh, development of uh, Moscow industry. Naturally, the next important challenge is. Uh, I mean, after the economic structure, of course, you know, resolving issues of the economic structure, it's important that we look at simulation of innovations. Innovations, you know, is um, a very common word today, like modernization. But uh, speaking about priorities of the modernization uh, policy of Moscow, I'd uh, stipulate three main points. Budget procurement, we all know about them. and. Uh, it's uh, those are not oriented on Moscow or Russian producer, but uh, simulation of innovation demand, uh, and that's the Moscow policy where the Moscow policy might be different from the federal policy. And number two, the formulation, the setting up of an electronic city, uh, electronic um, electronic means for uh, communication with the authority and um, uh, switching to electronic means in the city, in the uh, life of the city. And Sergei Semenovich also mentioned it. Uh, you know, Moscow is larger than Estonia, but it is smaller than Russia. And the challenge has is, is to 
Uh, the challenge is to uh, make uh, a uh, total information information society. You know, Estonia puts it as its priority, and in Moscow, I think we also can can meet this challenge. And uh, International Financial Center, number point number three. It's an institutional benchmark. It's a framework getting closer to which we can resolve the issues of innovative renewal and the structure of uh, the economy. And Wrapping up my presentation, I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, issue of the quality of uh, the uh, city environment. Of course, uh, retaining creative class is impossible without um, uh, without having this creative class uh, to uh, go uh, somewhere, somewhere else uh, for vacations, uh, to go to go abroad, for instance. And of course, the quality of the city environment is a special and fundamental challenge for us. I'd like to highlight two, two issues, main issues here. I'm just, I'm not going to explain something about them, but just the first one is the problem of three centers. Moscow is a political environment entrepreneurial and cultural center and of course all these uh, three things are interlinked and uh, they um, especially if they are located in one place but it's a question for me I can't answer it today uh, you know the trend is that they should go away from each other in the Moscow agglomeration space or uh, we should think about them to interlink to interlink them even more. So it's one of the challenges, one of the questions we should answer in the future. And number two, new principles of urban planning. In the urban literature, it is um, it is described as a city park, park city. When I when I lived um, in Sretinka and in uh, Prospect Mira, you know, uh, I saw lots of trees there, but uh, they just ceased to exist. I do not remember when it happened, but I remember that the trees were were around Moscow everywhere. And when people told me that in New York they didn't have trees at all, I couldn't understand that. Well, how, how, how come? Uh, I see trees everywhere in Moscow. I saw them everywhere in Moscow. But but uh, some time ago, when I was a student or, uh, or at another period of time, these trees ceased to exist. So that's why this um, park, city, city park, is a very important challenge for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mao, a question to the ex-mayor of Chicago, uh, Mr. Daly. First, so that everybody gets it. So the question is, at uh, this crossroads, uh, Vladimir mentioned uh, this, uh, us choosing a model of economic growth, development of infrastructure, and creation of a comfortable environment. These are these are challenges of uh, uh, lots of um, huge mega policies, mega cities, and Chicago is one of them. And what are the crossroads? Uh, what were the crossroads of Chicago? Uh, and uh, how did you choose the way to develop the city? I think uh, in the future of the city of Chicago, you respect the past, you live in the present, and you look to the future. And the mayor here made the, the, the case for the future, the transformation of Moscow. And if you look at all the things he talked about, you can close your eyes, you can be in any city in the world. Public transportation, the environment, the education, the quality of the workforce, the commitment of working with the community on behalf of the community, the commitment of being a public servant. And to me, that's what it is. We serve the public as elected officials. And to me, that enthusiasm and the confidence they have for the future, but the key about uh, the mega cities, if you look at the history of mega cities, it dealt with economics. It dealt with the business community. And so you have to, how do you transform the seat of government, which is here? How do you then bring in the private sector? As mayor of the city of Chicago, the, the biggest asset that I had was the public private sector. Uh, the public and private work together. That doesn't mean there'll be differences of opinion, but you need the private sector perspective in dealing with the operation of government. And that's why this mayor is bringing in uh, basically people from the private sector to bring new ideas, new innovation. And the creative class is here. We have universities, you have cultural institutions, and you don't have to uh, do any PR where Moscow is in the world. Every day they're mentioning Moscow. Now how do you, how do you create uh, the creative class not only here, but for the rest of the world. 
And to me, you have to allow your students to study abroad. You have to have more foreign students. And the idea of the business community, the global community, the business community has to be part of the city's growth in this country. It has to be, if you're not, then they shy away from it. If you look at other countries, they're inviting the private sector into their, into their cities. And that's one thing Chicago has always done. You have to change. If you don't change the city, then they live in the past. And no one ever wants to live in the past. And to me, uh, uh, the, the, the enthusiasm the mayor has and his understanding of what people need and the transformation as quickly as possible. And we learn from one another. Uh, mega cities are rising throughout the world. It's going to be the new economic and political power of the world because there are 20, 30, 40, 50 million people. And it's not just the city, now it's the regions they're looking at. And so you're going to see a whole new movement throughout the world of these mega cities, economically and politically, and how they reach out to each other irrespective of the national governments. Very interesting. They're reaching out with trade agreements. They're reaching out with best practices. They're understanding that they have more relationship together as quickly as possible uh, to basically benefit the quality of life of the people here. Also, as mayor, I planted more trees in Chicago than anyone else. I love, love trees. Because what it does is it shows you the transformation that can take place. Uh, a, a tree does. It grows just like your child. Uh, and it grows with the city. And to me, uh, when you come into a city, I just want to tell you, in arriving at the airport, the new Air international airport, I've been airports all over the world. That was, that was the fastest way. I didn't have no, there were no escorts. I got off the plane. I went run th right through the process. It was the quicker, the most fastest time I've ever done in the world, how they processed you through here in Moscow. And I want to congratulate those that are all working with this technology. You have to have confidence who you are. When you have confidence, as, as, as people from Moscow, as leaders and business leaders, you have confidence in the world. You, you should not look down where you are today, because I visited other cities. You're far advanced where you are in many things you've done. Just the, the transportation system that you've had for years. Remember, that's been the envy of the world. And so you live, you respect the past, uh, but you're always looking to the future. And, and to me, a forum like this brings out the passion, enthusiasm, and the confidence that the younger people have here in Moscow. I, I feel that and when you go to the hotel, you, you feel when you're meeting people, they have confidence of where this city is going to go in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. But let me ask, you, you said that one of the key themes in uh, Chicago was trying to bring in the private sector and, and involve them in governance. Did you, did you end up just bringing in uh, specialists uh, kind of from business and, and they were appointed in, in the civil service or actually just uh, building up new ways to deliver city services? Well, if you look at Singapore, what they have, a, it's a city state. They bring in people from the private sector to really manage government for four years, five years, and they move them back. I have found out uh, the, 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 you need private sector people to look at government completely different. I am an instructor at the University of Chicago, public policy. I don't allow my public policy students who ever work for government first. Work for the private sector, then come into government with innovation, creativity, and understanding what the private sector has in, in, into the, into the uh, public sector. I'll give you an example. We, get, we The city and the, uh, and the business community gave a gift to the people of the city of Chicago called the Millennium Park. The business community raised $300 million for me. I basically put about $250 million into, into the park for the foundation and the garage. And everything you saw at the Millennium Park, 25 acres, is from the private sector. We in turn then, after we built the parking facility, we leased the parking facility, made $25 million off it. And, and then we then put that money back into the park system. But the private sector did it out of basically the appreciation of how successful they've been in Chicago and thanking the people who have worked for their companies over many years. That's public-private partnership. Anything I've done dealing with education, housing, jobs, it's always been the private sector giving me advice dealing with the issue and how we can work together 
to deal with that issue. And besides the academic community, uh, that is important, but you need uh, the private sector there. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce, uh, we have the governor of uh, Tunis, Adel Bem Hassan, on our stage to welcome. And we will also um, listen to uh, to his speech a bit later. Uh, just a couple of slides. I wanted to cite a couple of uh, figures here because, as Mr. Mao said, Gorod is not, uh, city is not uh, only a, a living environment, a, an environment for living uh, for people, but a driver of economic growth. And as Mr. Daly said, uh, the uh, private sector should be interested and should be involved into the process of development, but it has to. Uh, it, it, else, it also has to have opportunities to be uh, to prosper in the uh, city's environment. Uh, the next slide, please. Can I just start from here? A very important factor here is that uh, cities uh, are drivers of economic growth. And on this slide, we can see that countries with the major part of population living in cities, the more the more prosperity uh, they witness in Russia, more than 75% uh, of population uh, live in cities. So that's uh, the source of prosperity uh, for our our population. And historically, we also witnessed this trend. But we should know the sources of uh, of uh, economic growth. And of course, uh, cities are uh, are these engines for economic growth all over the world, and Russia is not any, uh, is not um, different here. But uh, the tempos of uh, the growth rates of uh, of economy through, of throughout the world are growing, and here we can see the number of years uh, to achieve uh, doubled uh, doubled um, figures uh, of uh, GDP per capita. 150 years it took the United Kingdom and a bit, uh, a bit less than that it took the United States uh, to achieve. And some countries achieved it in just 10 years. And in our country we also, uh, we also set these goals. And we think that Moscow in uh, the nearest future will try to also meet this challenge how to, uh, how to grow twofold this economic growth and who will be the drivers of this economic growth and how we can actually meet the challenges of housing construction in this uh, on this backdrop i can say that 600 cities uh, across the world uh, covers uh, si covers 65 percent of economic growth of the planet by 2025 so economic growth is concentrated in cities but uh, you can see here on this slide just um, to the left, 47% of the whole planet's growth will come from cities of developing economies and only 17% from the cities of uh, European and the United States cities. So this uh, lessons of growth uh, that were learned by uh, the Western countries, they are sometimes, uh, they do not um, they do not uh, seem relevant today because uh, the uh, thing is that the growth is coming from cities from developing countries. And so, so you can see here this picture that shows us that the center of economic activities, uh, so the geographical center of uh, creativeness uh, on the planet. So now it's in Asia, and it was in Asia, and now it is also in Asia. It, uh, it sticks there, and uh, the dialogue with uh, various Asian countries and Chinese experience are very, it's very important for us. Uh, let's skip this slide. Another important point, this economic growth uh, creates new consumers, two billion, two new, uh, two new billion um, consumers uh, are, um, are, be, are, will be located in various cities. Uh, they are located in uh, developing countries and including, uh, including Russia. And so consumers, working people, uh, they, they become consumers and it's also a factor, a very important factor for uh, cities development. For this growth to happen, uh, we should be very, um, very uh, reasonable in terms of um, investment policy. Uh, the level of um, an infrastructure construction, so that's the level that will be needed uh, to uh, meet the challenges. Container, uh, 
container transport and logistics uh, is quite a challenge for various cities because they need lots of goods and services uh, to sustain their growth. Of course, it is relevant for Asian cities and Asian countries, but we should plan how we, uh, how we balance this growth and how we position this logistics center. Of course, all these things should be considered in advance. A very important fact, um, the density of uh, cities' population enable uh, enable governments uh, to offset uh, costs, uh, various costs, because if you have infrastructure in place, then you can offset various costs of uh, transportation, roads and water networks. The costs go down by 30 to 40 percent for cities, um, uh, for cities of, for instance, 12 million people comparing to uh, smaller cities. But it's, it might seem as an obvious thing, but uh, uh, we should think of it that uh, the density, the density in terms of economy, is is an advantage. Uh, another thing about ports in cities, uh, in cities, cities are more. Uh, eco, uh, eco reasonable places. If we just develop suburban areas, then it won't look like this. The picture would be different. In the Northern America, we can see that uh, 20 to 30 percent with uh, all this pressure, uh, for the environment, 20 to 30 percent more efficient the cities are. And Mr. Mao also mentioned this figure, uh, the GDP of largest cities in the world, 2007, dark blue developing developed economies and um, light blue developing markets, and uh, to the right, uh, 2025. So half of uh, these cities are cities from developing countries, and Moscow should be number 16, but uh, now on it's on the list, and I think it might um, it might enter the top 10. I think the opportunities for growth are really significant and we should think about how to ensure this growth uh, to happen. On this chart, on this chart, we can see comparison of uh, economic growth of a mega city uh, with the uh, growth rates of the country it is located in. Uh, less than 100 uh, percent, some, some are higher than that. Moscow, Moscow, 182. So the economy is growing quite quickly. And of course, this this uh, growth rate will go down, and of course uh, we will also we will also see it impacting the construction and housing policy of the city. And about the balance of economic growth and infrastructure growth, and uh, better uh, better conditions for for our people, for people in the cities, and we will discuss it uh, in more details. I think during these two days. Uh, sorry, John, John. I'm sorry, John. John, I wanted to turn to you. Um, I want to ask a question. As you think about cities' growth growth paths, what do you think are the key questions, key key factors that need to be taken into account, including to capture the benefits of growth, but to retain those let's say, creative class, as was mentioned, or those talented people who you want to be in your region? Thank you. Um, I, want to, I want to pick up on... Speak to the microphone. I want to speak to the microphone. Um, I was very struck by Mayor Dibianian's comments about self-management. Um, I think it's a very important concept, because but there aren't really creative cities and global cities. There are creative people and global people. Um, and Mayor Daly talked about the, the contribution of business. And I would add actually the non-profit sector to that. Uh, and I'm sure you would too. Um, if you look at the, the growth of competitive developing cities, over hundreds of years. It's the business communities, their ability to grow and develop inside of the city that has led to the growth of the city. 
I did some work uh, three years ago in China looking at the curriculum for teenagers in Chinese schools and we came up with the idea of a creative ecology which has four elements, change and diversity, learning and adaptation. And in my experience, what makes a city a nice place to live in, a comfortable place to live in, uh, an exciting place to look in, is when the people there have the capacity to learn and the capacity to adapt. First the capacity to learn, then the capacity to adapt. They can learn from their neighbors, they can learn from their work colleagues, they can learn from somewhere else in the world, on the internet and the web. Having learned, they have to adapt. Having seen a better way to do something, they have to be able in their own community to take that lesson and change their conditions. So it's learning and adaptation. The creative class Mr. Mao mentioned is critically important in this because the creative class live off of learning and adaptation. But there, there is a question here about the creative class, which is this, which is, yes, it exists, yes, it's important, yes, probably everybody here is a member of this class of people and we're very lucky. But if we have a creative class, clearly there's a class of people who are not creative. There's a non-creative class. And how do people move from one to the other? Huh? What is the meritocratic process that people move from one to the other? If, again, if you look at really creative cities, you see that mobility is very fluid. They're very open cities. They're very transparent. They're very fluid. They're very competitive. They're very noisy. They're very crowded. They're very tough. Creativity is very difficult, very tough, and a creative city is a very it's a very tough place to be, it's an exhausting place to be. This is not an easy life to build a creative city. <laughs> it's not an easy life at all. And many people can't cope with it and they don't like it. And we have to accept that when we build up our, our creative cities. Um, I, I just want to make two final points that occurred to me as I was listening to the speakers. Um, one is what I call the new openness or the new localness. The, the old way of building a building, which we do see sometimes in Moscow, is blank walls, barriers around the building, difficult to get into. It's the architecture of Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid. We are now moving to a new openness in our architecture. The Barclays Center, Brooklyn, New York, is the, the, the Barclays Center in New York, um, where the mayor had a design by Frank Gehry on the table, turned it down, went to a new co-working collective, and built a wonderful bank, a banking center, completely transparent. I want to put into the discussion these notions of learning, change, adaptation, which happens most easily, most quickly in the private sector, not in government, because the, the power is moving from government to business and non-profits. And this notion of learning and adaptation and how we encourage the citizens to do that. Thank you. John, just a follow-up to that. One, one of the speakers, I think, mentioned that Moscow has traditionally, I think, Professor Mao, Moscow traditionally was ahead of many other cities in Russia. In a way, many look to Moscow as an example. How do you do this or that? Uh, have you seen, and, and one of the opportunities is for Moscow to actually spread the successful practices to other cities in Russia. Have you seen such models of experience transfer you know, between cities? And as anybody else certainly 
could please comment because I think in Russia we, we have, as we know, very hierarchical traditions, but there's a lot of potential for experience sharing which is not used. Have you seen such examples? It's, it's very rare. I, there's, there's, a, there's a move for centers, clusters of excellence and global competitiveness to get better at what they do, to suck in energy from the rest of the country um, and to suck in people, to suck in money. Um, and federal, national governments always face this, this challenge. We want our really big cities to become even better and globally more competitive. And that's a good thing, as the speaker said. It helps the rest of the country. At the same time, you want to have equality of opportunity around the whole country. And that means putting probably government public resources to help people in the rest of the country to have the opportunity to join that excellent city. It's a, it's a policy conundrum. You never resolve it. You, you can't have a highly competitive business or highly competitive place in, this, in the big city somehow sharing. That's against, that's against the, the pressure to become more competitive, more elitist, stronger internationally. Richard, you had a comment. Right. In 19, uh, I got elected in 1989. In 1995, we had 300 suburban uh, cities outside the city of Chicago. And I said to myself, if Chicago is going to succeed, we need the cooperation of the suburban area. So we have a Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. We meet four times a year, not just in the city of Chicago, but throughout the, the metropolitan area. Because if we don't come to it as a region to meet as a mega city, a city itself, by itself, boundaries cannot compete. And so my theory is what was good for the suburban area is good for Chicago. And good for Chicago was good for them. So we went to the state and national governments as a group. Not as Democrats, not as Republicans, not as suburban mayors or a big city mayor. So I had the wherewithal to help them politically in, in Washington, D.C., with Democrats and Republicans, as well as in state capital. And so little things that affected them. Now what they're doing, they're consolidating their police, their fire department, cutting the costs of their government down. Because if we, we, we look as a region, you just don't think of, oh, I'm going to Chicago. You go to the region. And that goes up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it goes to Indiana, it goes all the way to southern Illinois. And to me, that's how you have to look at it in this structure. And John was right. The business community and not-for-profit, I, I include them together because the not-for-profit in the city of Chicago has been supported by the private sector. They have basically have the MacArthur Foundation, huge foundations from families and corporations to deal with social issues. And that was one issue. The Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, MacArthur Foundation, supported us on that concept. It is, let's go a, a, as a region and not stop competing with one another. And to me, that's been very successful. Um, thank you. Uh, Simon, uh, question to you. you. You've looked a lot at ways cities link up with other communities, how they're perceived, how they perhaps shape, shape the, their perception. Um, what would be your thoughts about where Moscow stands? What would be maybe your advice on what Moscow should focus on as it defines its place in the, in the global linkages? Uh, Simon has slides, uh, so please uh, show them on the screen. I, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I just wanted to uh, answer Yanmole's question with um, a little bit of data. This is changing the subject a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the way that cities are perceived by other people in other countries. This is an absolutely critical question, of course, because one of the main consequences of globalization is that we live in an age where there really is only one superpower left on the planet, and that superpower is global public opinion. That superpower 
is a body with which we are all of us in one way or another trying to do diplomacy, to attract investment, to attract tourists, to attract talent, to stop our own people leaving, a problem that Moscow is, is facing all the time. Um, I just want to show you some data about perceptions of Moscow. This may depress you a little bit, but I hope I'll uh, cheer you up immediately afterwards. Um, these two surveys, the Nation Brands Index and the City Brands Index, are uh, studies which I've been running um, since 2005. Um, very large studies. Uh, I was told uh, recently that they are amongst the largest social surveys ever conducted. I've collected over, in fact, 200 billion data points about what ordinary people around the world think about other countries and other cities. Not the reality, necessarily, but the perception. And um, it's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating what you discover. Um, I won't go into the details. Uh, this is a very large subject. Uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, uh, I've got a much longer session where I can explain all of this in considerably more detail. But I just wanted to point to a, a couple of interesting facts about perceptions of Moscow today. The way that I measure the images of cities is according to this hexagon model. We're looking, we're asking ordinary people in many countries questions about how they regard cities in these six core areas. What sort of people do you think live in the city? What sort of lifestyle is in the city that's pulse? Do you think it's an exciting place to live or to spend some time? Potential is the question, what's in it for me? If I were to live in Moscow or another city, would it be good for my career, for my life? Prerequisites at the bottom is about the ability to live in that city, do things work. Presence is about the overall sense of the city's importance. Is it an important city? Does it mean something to people around the world? And finally, place, just the physical reality, the climate, what it's like to be there. Now, the first seven cities in the City Brands Index are the expected ones. Paris, London, Sydney perhaps not so expected. And if I had time, I'd explain why Sydney is up there. New York, Los Angeles, Rome, Washington DC, and on and on and on and on. We get to number 38 before we arrive at Moscow. Now, what I've also done is I've given you a selection of some of the individual panel countries in the survey to show you how their own rankings for Moscow vary. As you can see, um, India, for example, ranks Moscow considerably higher than uh, the majority of other uh, populations around the world. India looks like a remarkable opportunity for Russia generally. The Indians have an extraordinarily high opinion relative to the average of both Moscow and Russia. The Russians themselves have a relatively low opinion of Moscow. But again, we'd have to look in more detail to see what they rank as important and what as less so. The rest of the world, generally speaking, does not rank Moscow as being one of the cities with the best image or the best profile in the world. There are only 50 countries in the index, so 38 is fairly near the bottom. Let's have a look at some individual questions. The, uh, the red ones are the ones where the scores are very, very low indeed. Um, if you go down to the third question from the bottom, uh, this is about the perception of the people. If I went to Moscow, would I find that people are friendly towards me or cold? Moscow in this respect ranks 49th out of 50. In other words, the perception of the majority of people around the world, and remember the sample of this survey approximates to more than 60% of the world's population. They believe that almost nowhere on earth would they get a colder reception from the population than they get in Moscow? It's not true, of course. And I also feel I have to add, this is not my opinion. This is the opinion of about 38,000 of my closest friends. Again, you see the Indians don't believe that. The Indians expect a warmer welcome. The Russians place their own capital city last. The average Russian believes that you get a colder reception in Moscow than in any other city on the planet. That's also quite interesting. And I just want to point to the very last one, climate. This is meteorological climate. Is it a nice place to be weather-wise? 
No is the answer of the world's population. It's certainly not. But if you look at the third category there, the global contribution, that's number 12. Global contribution means, do you think that Moscow has, in the past, and continues to contribute to the world in some way? Nobody doubts the importance of Moscow. It's not very positive, but nobody doubts its importance. And with all this talk of uh, creative communities and creative industries, well, my view is perhaps a rather similar one. I was brought up in England in the 1960s with a reverence for Chekhov and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Pushkin and Tchaikovsky and Borodin and Rimsky-Korsakov and all the rest of them. For me, Russia and Moscow was part of the soul of the world. It was one of the five most important places in the world, in Europe indeed. Now, creative classes or creative industries is a rather poor, rather shallow, perhaps rather bureaucratic, rather private sector word for that concept of soul. But my view, put very simply, is that if Moscow wants to reacquire a position in the world, a liking, an admiration, an attractiveness which is equal to its sense of importance, it's somehow also got to rediscover its soul. But more on that later on. Sorry, that was a very long answer to your question, Jan Monet. I don't know if I'm allowed to answer another question after all. <laughs> But what, what, would you, what would you do? I mean, uh, if you were in the shoes of the, let's say, Moscow uh, government, Moscow citizens, uh, how, how would you begin to explain to people, you know, more of the nuances, let's say, and the richness of the city? Well, it's very interesting that you use the phrase, how, how would you explain it? And I think that's very often where the problems start. Um, most cities and most countries uh, are in the position of Moscow they feel that they deserve a better reputation than they get. And therefore it's logical to think, we know we're wonderful, everybody else doesn't realize it, therefore we need to tell them how wonderful we are. This is a terrible mistake, because nobody cares and nobody is listening. The fundamental reality is that if you want people to admire you, you have to do something to make yourself admirable. The cities which are admired are the cities which do something for other people around the world. So the question has got to be, what has Moscow done for me today? If I'm living in London, or New York, or Chicago, or Mumbai, or Vientiane, the question is not, how wonderful is Moscow, because I don't care. The question for me is, what has Moscow done for the world that I live in? If I have a sense that Moscow is making a contribution in some way to my life, or the lives of other people around the world, then I will admire it. So, to put it brutally, it's what you do, it's not what you say. Don't waste money on propaganda. It doesn't work. Do these, uh, you know, visit uh, Moscow campaigns on CNN, is that a good use of money, or are you just invested in the city? Uh, on the whole, I think it's a shocking and irresponsible waste of taxpayers' money. There is absolutely no proof whatsoever that it achieves anything at all. Propaganda is possible when you control all the channels of communication reaching your audience, and then you can brainwash them. One of the wonderful things about globalization is that it's made propaganda impossible. <laughs> well, countries learn that at their own pace, I guess. Um, thank you. Um, Ksenia, I would like to ask uh, you. Uh, Simon said that um, very often, even uh, it, uh, to explain to people who we are, maybe we should do something differently and demonstrate it in a different way, uh, acting somehow. So you are now playing the role of uh, the coordinator of our process, Russian process of involvement in the business and state G20. So you always face, I'm sure, with the reaction of our colleagues and your colleagues, the foreign colleagues, uh, and their perception of Russia. Does it correspond somehow? Maybe it's a, a wider thing than just uh, what said Sa Simon. What's their reaction? What's their perception? And what seems important uh, of, um, and what we should do in Moscow and uh, the country to improve uh, the perception of foreigners of our city? And especially, it is especially important in this topic of Moscow as international financial center, how to attract people. So how, what's your perception? What's your overview? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kermalai. I, 
I'd start with something different. I'd start with uh, what has already been said here. Moscow, uh, Ma Moscow undergoes a transformation and uh, it is uh, becoming a post-industrial city and it's a role for uh, large uh, agglomerations, uh, you know, they are centers of uh, modern sectors of business services, uh, including financial. And of course, uh, for Moscow, it is possible to play this role of a financial center, center and innovation center for the innovation center and uh, for uh, business services. In this sense, Moscow Moscow has uh, two challenges to face. So one of them was already articulated. The thing that Moscow is a global city with global population. When we do, when we uh, speak about it as a financial center, we say that we should attract more foreigners to work here. But we should know, we should understand that people who work in this sector, they are a bit foreigners because they are they are the citizens of the global world and they also compete in the global market. And the quality of uh, work and uh, the quality of life they should get here, they should also be similar to what they can get in other countries countries. So we create our cities, not only our city, not only for foreigners, but for our people competing in international markets. That's the first point. Uh, point number two, I already mentioned, when we speak about discuss Moscow, you know, I visited a couple of discussions and meetings in Moscow and in Russian speaking discussions, we speak a lot about quality of life and transportation and traffic jams and what uh, buildings should be constructed and uh, hotels and so on and so forth. We are not speaking about business climate and it was very indicative uh, today that uh, uh, speaking about uh, involvement of private sector and its role in the uh, in the in the life of the city. You know, all these things were mentioned by our foreign participants of this panel, and they were the first to highlight this uh, issue. And it is important that we do not split uh, these two things, quality of life and quality of business environment. And uh, irrespective of uh, the city, the uh, quality of business environment is very important. If we create a financial, international financial center, it doesn't cancel cancel the thing that uh, the whole business environment should be very good and in particular for financial for the financial sector a couple of issues i'd like to also articulate uh, uh, you talked about um, a lot about education but when we create a global city for people competing in global markets then it's uh, a completely different type of education, including uh, school education, opportunities uh, of educa educational opportunities for children uh, who will uh, who will afterwards compete in international labor markets, and uh, the same thing about healthcare uh, and uh, and medicine, and uh, these issues of perception of Moscow and Russia. What, uh, what we can make to better the situation, to better the picture. The slides that were already shown here, we perceive ourselves quite critically and the attitude of ourselves is quite, is quite critical, uh, is, is, um, you know, a bit negative, and it's an indicative thing, a very illustrative one, and it is uh, connected with uh, two main challenges here. First, uh, you know, this self-criticism, which is um uh, which is uh, streamlined at uh, uh, at uh, bettering and and making improvements, and sometimes it contributes. Uh, sometimes it it makes the whole picture even worse, actually. And number two, these uh, attempts at splitting things we do for uh, for internal use and things for external use. We we should know that uh, the same people listen to us, and uh, we should translate. Uh, the same ideas everywhere and it's uh, very important you know and in my job I can see it quite obviously that uh, that you shouldn't split these things and even a technical issue we grant an interview for Russian uh, for Russian 
readership, but it doesn't mean that foreigners, uh, uh, for the Russian audience, it, but it doesn't mean that the foreigners um, uh, won't see it, you know. Such uh, small, minor, minor things uh, about uh, policies and information policies. You know, we do things for ourselves, for internal use, and for external use, and we think that they are different, that they should be different. And but I don't think we are right thinking this way. And the country is open and closed at the same time. I mean that uh, with all our uh, love to. Uh, of traveling, you know, our mentality is, uh, uh, you know, very reserved and uh, changing this mentality. I think uh, the changes will come with time and the whole attitude uh, will change. The attitude, um, the attitude of uh, foreigners towards our, our, our country. But what's the number of foreign tourists? Uh, there is in in Russia, in Moscow. I do not know, actually. I can't see them at all, you know. But coming to, when I come to London or Paris, I can see huge groups of tourists in the streets. But when you come to Moscow, okay, if you travel uh, travel along uh, the Sofiska embankment, you can see a couple of buses with people who um, who try to make photos of the Kremlin from the other side of the river, but uh, these, the number of tourists are incomparable with the number of tourists in other cities. Uh, speaking about perception of the city, that's how people think of it and the uh, elements uh, that uh, actually create the whole picture of the city. Uh, the fact that this element of uh, tourists coming to a city and they uh, they walk and and um, look at things, uh, of course they just uh, they can see the facade only, but uh, they cannot see the internal situation. But development of tourism in the city is a crucial moment, a very important moment indeed, and it is undervalued by the city. The city now is focused on itself, not uh, to the outside, and it, it doesn't think about its global nature. And in terms of perception, these are, you know, quite important things. But sorry for this fussy, uh, fussy speech, but I can... Simon, you had a comment. Please, you're welcome. To uh, add a point to that, um, remember that all of these Russians who are tourists in other countries around the world, and we complain about the mass emigration of Russians to other parts of the world, that's a good thing as well as a bad thing, because those are your diplomats. That is your informal diplomatic service, and it's worth asking the question, are they good diplomats for Moscow and for Russia, or bad ones, and can one do something about it? It's an enormous weapon at your disposal. <clears throat> um, let me let, let's turn to the, the, the Middle East and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Ben Hassan. Let, let me ask you uh, how. Uh, <laughs> What can Moscow do for you? <laughs> it, it, it sound, that was the question, you know, what can be the role of Moscow globally? Uh, what, what would you want Moscow to do to be a better city for its citizens and also for the citizens of Tunis? Thank you. I'm really, very really honored to be here today. And I'm coming from a country which made its revolution. And uh, let me say that now we are trying very hardly to restore order in the country. And uh, the best way to do that is to cooperate with the uh, mega cities, because now, especially the capital city, I'm the governor of the capital city of Tunis, of Tunisia, Tunis. We have a, uh, an internal migration which is uh, making uh, the city growing and we cannot master the, 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 this internal uh, migration in, uh, in Tunis. And that's why we have a, uh, a deep need to cooperate with the uh, cities who, which have, which has a, an experience in managing the, uh, <clears throat> let me say, the uh, disorder. 
So I think that with, uh, we, we, have, we need an uh, international cooperation to uh, learn about your experience after the uh, revolutionary situations. It's very hard to manage it. So we, ha we, we need to learn from uh, other countries and other mega cities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Sergei Semenovich. Sergei Semenovich, from what has been said, uh, maybe Moscow needs uh, needs to you know strengthen the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, uh, you know to better this cooperation with other cities and other countries. We spoke, you spoke a lot about these plans of city development. Are there any areas uh, of uh, international cooperation development? Um, uh, do you plan something like that? Uh, I'd like to comment what has been said, if I may. Yes, please. You know, all presenters today spoke, spoke about um, big cities and they say that um, there's, uh, the big cities, big cities are not evil things. Uh, big cities are drivers of uh, economic growth and uh, sources of uh, development. We say things about cities and that they, you know, squeeze everything from the countries they are located in and uh, people tend to say that Moscow squeezes everything from the Moscow region and Russia and uh, Moscow takes uh, takes it all, all resources, financial people and so on and so forth. And I, I often hear things like that, but it was said uh, quite rightfully that uh, where urbanization is underway and where the concentration of people is high, that's uh, the places where economic breakthroughs are done and the places where economy is developing and uh, GDP per capita and prosperity is also growing. And uh, we can see these things and they are obvious for us. Uh, well, uh, it might not be obvious in Europe because uh, Europe is a just is a single big city but uh, looking at what happens um, in the Middle East and even in the United States we can see continuing uh, continuous urbanization and concentration of population and we can be intimidated by these things, but we should consider them, and those are natural processes that we can try to hamper and to stop them, but that means that you hamper and stop the economy of your own country and the economy of the civilization, and it is important. But what is important and what is needed, actually, we have to make this development and this concentration uh, to uh, look natural and to have the infrastructure of these large cities for it to develop a half step forward uh, from its uh, from the whole pattern of development for authorities and mayors of cities and the and the community for them to understand how to better develop their cities and what the priorities are and i entirely agree with my colleagues of course the priorities are first of all lie in infrastructure, and uh, infrastructure is about the, comf the level of comfort of living in this city for the creative class and the whole population, and that's the most important thing in any approach we choose. And when we speak about the image of the city and uh, what people think about it, of course, first of all, we should uh, think um, not about what uh, foreigners think of us, but uh, we should uh, know what we actually think of ourselves and how we perceive ourselves. And that's uh, that's the city we live in, and that's the most important thing of all. But uh, for make the whole picture better, uh, the level of communications uh, where where people where people are alienated from the government and there is no consolidation of uh, of the community and the government when it is in place. It's it's a very pity thing to have, and the main challenge for us and for any city and for Moscow especially, this consolidation of population, that's the challenge. Uh, we have to resolve the issues that we face. We have to make the city more comfortable and make uh, the public spaces uh, better to improve them and make them the best in the country, in the world, and uh, that's when we start thinking about our city differently. But we just made first steps in this direction. 
direction. But we think that the priorities are, are quite um, sensible and reasonable. And colleagues, uh, colleagues support this opinion and they support the areas we chose uh, for our priorities. And speaking about uh, cooperation with other cities and uh, and uh, local authorities, of course, it's, it becomes quite obvious that Moscow cannot be seen separately, cannot be perceived separately from the Moscow region. The Moscow region is constructing 8 million square meters of housing every year and in its potential and in its population it is something comparable to Moscow today and it's uh, it has to be developed in conjunction with uh, with the city we have to make it a single space a single planning uh, planning area and infrastructure without that uh, we cannot uh, we won't see a um, harmonized development in the future that's one of our challenges again thank you Thank you. Thank you, Sergei Semenovich. So we are a bit uh, behind uh, the schedule, about 15 minutes behind the schedule. So I'd like uh, to uh, wrap up our uh, our discussion. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants and have a good and fruitful forum. Thank you. Объявляется перерыв до 11.45. Приглашаем вас в фойе на кофе -брейк. Ladies and gentlemen, there will now be a break until 11.45. We invite you to the foyer for tea and coffee.